Today I'm joined by someone who doesn't need an introduction. If you're somewhere in the world of strength and conditioning, Dan Baker. Dan has 20 plus years of experience in professional rugby. Dan is president of the Australian Strength and Conditioning Association. Dan holds a PhD in sports science. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, Dan has worked with the Brisbane Broncos for 19 years, I guess, yeah. and you have worked across different Olympic sports as yes. well as a consultant. Yes. Yeah. Um, I've seen Dan the first time at the UK SCA conference in 2007. No, no, no. In two, I was already working here, so it must have been 2010, 2011, mm. and um, I really enjoyed it. I think what I've always liked about you is that you are really a practitioner. So. Thank you. Further ado, <laughs> welcome Dan. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Christian. Yeah. Um, then, how did you get into strength and conditioning? Ah, uh, that's what I wanted to do. <laughs> um, uh, I come from a fairly sporty family, not at a high level. Just uh, you know, my father believed everyone should do sport. They had three brothers, three sisters. Um, we all did sport, just you know, recreationally. My oldest brother, uh, he, he was a good semi-professional footballer and uh, a decent level boxer. Um, but we, so we're all very sporty. Um, but I was a, a little bit fat when I was a, a child. So when I got to about 14 or 15, I uh, started training r really hard uh, to lose weight. I'd go with my brother to the boxing gym when it wasn't football season, I just then I started doing lots of running, lifting weights, and all that. Just you know, because I was a little bit fat, I want to get better at sport, and uh, so I suppose I just developed interest from there, uh, finding ways to get better and better and better, and uh, so that that started when I was like fourteen and a half years of age. So when I finished school, I then chose obviously uh, I was really into it by then. I was. Uh, uh, so I went from you know a, a, a fat type sports person into you know I ran in the school cross country team, um, uh, which would have been unthinkable, uh, say three years beforehand. Um, and I was you know I was in the school cross country team, but I was a, a front row forward in rugby, which is two different abilities. You know, it's a front row in rugby is about strength and, and size. Cross country is about aerobic fitness but, but this is 1980 early 80s so I was doing aerobic fitness when no one was um, and lifting weights when no one was so they gave me a sort of advantage just at school level um, but it, 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 it was my interest so I got in I studied sports science in the early 80s and then um, I tried to be a strength conditioning coach in Australia in the 80s and it just wasn't happening it didn't exist hmm. we didn't have professional sport we had semi-professional sport who didn't believe in it so it wasn't until the no early 90s that you know I could actually start working as a, as a strength conditioning coach. Um, so I tried in the late 80s and I just couldn't, you know, and I didn't want to go back and do personal training. So I, I worked as a, in construction <laughs> for a while. And then um, I saw an ad for do a master's degree. And then as soon as I started doing my master's degree, it opened up for me again. So that was good in the early 90s. So. Mm. Mm. So you were one of the first SNC coaches in Australia, is that fair yes. to say? Yes, uh, yeah. Oh, there, there was there was a few employed at the Australian Institute of Sport, which was uh, uh, Kelvin Giles, uh, uh, Lynn Jones, uh, Harry Wardle, and I think Jeff Dam. So there were four, and uh, and uh, Ian King, who wasn't at the Institute of Sport. So there were probably five people who could make a living at it uh, mm. full time. And um, I was just sort of part time, and then I built up. So by the mid 1990s, it was probably maybe 10 or 15 or 20 people um, could make a living full time at it. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I, I, I was not in the first group to make a full time living, I was probably in the second group um, to make a full time living at it. Hmm. So, I was part time when they were full time. Uh, that, that was my aspiration. Okay, cool. <laughs> In your life as an SNC coach, what was your darkest moment? Ah, that's really easy. Uh, 
one of the former rugby players from a team, not the Brisbane Broncos, another team I worked with, uh, claimed he hurt his back squatting and tried to sue me for one and a half million dollars. Um, uh, the case didn't go to court, but uh, I had liability insurance with a company, uh, which the Australian Government Sports Commission told us to all to take out, and this company went bankrupt. So all of a sudden, I had no insurance cover for a lawyer to help me fight this case. And uh, uh, it was just, I was in the wilderness and I can't afford a lawyer, a lawyer type thing. Anyhow, the Australian government bailed out all the people because they told the people to take out this insurance. This company went broke. So I got uh, ended up getting a, a lawyer from the government uh, rescue fund. And uh, it was proven to be false, not a, not a true story. And uh, obviously some athletes, uh, they can't get a contract and they went looking for the... the hmm. The uh, other payday, which if probably, I don't know if it's happened here in, in Europe, but if you could think about the mid-1990s, a lot of people in Australia were following the American example of uh, let's sue and get some easy money. Mm. I fall off a chair in a, a bar. Oh, it's the bar's fault I fell off the chair. Or mm. I slip on a pavement. Let's sue the city council because the pavings aren't going to. So mm. there was a lot of that going on, and I think it sort of permeated people's minds. So it was proven not to be true in fact. Mm. I did not hurt his back. He sustained that back injury that he had at high school. And uh, I believe he was seeing a number of different physiotherapists to hide it from any one physical therapist, okay. how bad he was. But he was searching for a, a, you know, a, a, a renewal of his contract and it didn't happen. And uh, then he went looking for another payday. And I believe I was that victim. That, I believe that's what the situation was. Hmm. I had to go back. It's more than 20 years ago, but if my memory yeah. serves me, correct me. But I didn't get sued. Okay. He tried to sue me, but it was a very dark moment when I had no legal representation. Yeah. And the club that I worked for um, didn't want to have anything to do with it. They thought, you're, you're suing Baker, not the club. Hmm. Uh, it wasn't until the rescue lawyers came in and said to the club, no, Baker's your employee. He's suing you, and this player is suing you, the club, and Baker. Hmm. And then the club said, oh, oh we've got to join in and help. Hmm. So that was pretty bad. Uh, that club, I wouldn't piss in their ear if their brain was on fire. <laughs> now, that's how I feel about them. <laughs> okay. And then what did you learn from that moment? How has it shaped your yes. life after that? Um, there are some people who are very good people and some people will throw you under a bus or, or don't care about you. That's like I said, that club, I wouldn't piss in their ear if their brain was on fire. Hmm. Now might have to rethink that because one of my friends is now coaching them and it's 20 years ago and there's different people so but from for at least the last 18 years I've felt that about that club hmm. um, who I'm not going to name but uh, yeah. uh, and also the players you know I, I'm, I'm pretty careful in dealing I, I like people to be honest yeah so I'm honest I'm going to push you hard I'm going to train you hard and uh, just be honest Mm. Don't lie and scheme and try and use me to get other ways. So uh, I lost a lot of faith in some people from that situation. Mm. It was a dark situation for me. And did you take anything from that in terms of covering your ass after that? Yes, uh, always have liability insurance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it was, it was no problem because I always did everything correctly. We always warm up. Everyone wears a belt. You're given your load, not some mythical load that someone else, some other country is lifting. Oh, sure, let's squat 200 kilos. Um, He was a 107 kilogram man squatting 120 kilograms. How was that hard in like week nine of training? Mm. That's not an overload. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, I yeah. Get it. Okay. You know, 60 kilogram girls squat 120. Uh, strong ones. Yeah. So, uh, yes, but I always cover, you know, we always do everything uh, methodically and, and in a strictest liability sense. And, and you know, so I've always done that anyhow. So I wasn't really worried, but. Um, Uh, you need a lawyer to help you in those yeah. situations. Even if you've done nothing wrong, you still need a lawyer yeah. to navigate that legal minefield, which I couldn't afford. Yeah. Okay. Well, what was your best moment? Um, when I was at the Brisbane Broncos, we won four uh, premierships. That was pretty good. Uh, yeah, I suppose they're the best moments. Okay. Yeah, I suppose... Uh, Probably the last one was pretty sweet in 2006. 
that was the fourth we because we won in 97, 98, 2000. You thought that golden era would never end and you'd be winning <laughs> finals every year or two. For, and then we didn't win for five or six years and we won again in 2006. And then we didn't win again by the time I left in 2013. Okay. And they still haven't won. So <laughs> I suppose 2006 was the sweetest one yeah. um, in a way. What advice would you give your younger self if you could travel back in time, 10, 15 years, maybe 20 even? What advice would you give a younger Dan Baker? Yeah, don't do circuits. <laughs> 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 and do strength training. When I was younger, there was no internet, no books, no matter how to train. And uh, I started uh, training. I went to the boxing gym and all they did was circuits. I thought that's how you lifted weights. So I did mm. circuits every day for four years. With no progressive overload, it was the same circuit every day, same weights. <laughs> <laughs> so from about age 14 to about 17, I did virtually the same circuit every day. Uh, no, <laughs> and then I, uh, someone gave us a program on uh, German volume training. Mm -hmm. Except it wasn't 20 sets of 10. You started 20 sets of 10 and you built up to 50 sets of 10. <laughs> so I did that as well. <laughs> so I could go back now and... <laughs> I would just take my young body and just do proper training that I know what to do and it would be fantastic. <laughs> I wouldn't waste three or four years doing high rep circuit training. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> For young aspiring SNC coaches, what advice would you give with all the knowledge you have now? Get practical experience. Go with a mentor and uh, get practical experience. I'll give you an example in that, like, I, I joined my university powerlifting club because there was a guy in that club, there was a couple of guys who were really high ranked in the world, number two and number three, or number two and four, some of like that, you know, and um, I'd watch this guy train, and then I started going to training when he trained, you know, different, lifting different weights, just to watch him train and see what he does, and sooner or later there'd be no one in the gym because it's a weightlifting powerlifting club, and he'd say, oh, he'd look around, can you come over and spot me? So like, sure. You know, like stuff like that, or can you come over and um, pull my lifting strap over my shoulder and stuff like that? Yeah, sure, sure. And just suck up their knowledge. And then after a while, you know, they start relying on you. And um, he would say, uh, you, "What time are you training tomorrow? Because I need uh, someone to spot me." So I'll be there when you want. You mm. know. So if you find someone in your area who's a high-level lifter or a good tr track and field coach, just uh, get around when they are and watch how they coach, watch how they train suck up some knowledge. Do this while you're at university or the first year out when you've got time and gain, because what you're gaining there is not only experience for yourself, but you're gaining maybe 10, 15, 20 years of their experience mm. and then that seeps into your DNA because they start telling you stuff or you watch stuff, um, stuff that's not in books. So if, you, if there's some champion athletes or champion coaches in your area, um, make use of that resource. You know? mm. So that was really helpful for me to do mm. that because it wasn't just one guy; there was two or three, and you know I'd, I'd just suck up their information mm. and uh, like their dog's body and you know, help them spot. You know, I'd be doing my own lifting, and then that would help you. So you know, all of a sudden you're getting coached by guys number two or number three in the world. Mm. And so well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, that didn't cost me any money. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. Mm. There's a question I have out of personal interest. Mm. It seems to be if you look at the life cycle of an SNC coach or career paths, mm. very often it's SNC, head of SNC and you either go into lecturing or performance manager. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's what it is, right? Yep, exactly. Very often. You have never taken on the role as a performance manager. Were there no opportunities or was it something that didn't... That no, doesn't... You know, I don't want to do... The management stuff I do is with the ASC. I don't want to do man more management, you know. I like coaching. I like uh, coaching. So right now I'm not coaching athletes, I'm coaching coaches, but I'm still mm. coaching. Um, too much management stuff, you know, it bores the shit out of me. Mm. I want to be a coach. Um, I didn't go to university to be a manager. Yeah. I want to be a, you know, a strength conditioning coach. Now I do a lot of management stuff with the ASCA, so that I do that. I don't want to then do it as, again as well. But yeah, it's, it seems to be about a 15-year cycle and after you've been strength conditioning coach full-time, 15 years, you, you get to that part, point where you're maybe you're late 30s or early 40s maybe or somewhere around then you've got to go one or the other. Hmm. So 
Uh, I knew that was happening. That's one of the reasons I did my PhD because I knew I didn't really want to do management. So I thought, well, I've got to be a lecturer sometime in the future. And so uh, that's one of the reasons I did the PhD. Hmm. So you've got to have your backup plan ready. So you just can't say, hmm, well, I can't coach now or I don't feel like coaching. I always feel like coaching, but it, it, that, it's pretty hard lifestyle. Hmm. As you know, with the travel and high performance, and if you've got a wife or kids, it's sort of grates on you a lot. Um, so at a certain point, uh, the high performance, I think, Jesus is a hard lifestyle for the amount of money we get. I'd better off staying more put. Uh, not that I stay put now, but at least my wife comes with me hmm. uh, a lot. Uh, so yeah, it, you do have that choice. You've got to be a lecturer, or educator of some sort, or go into high performance management 100%, hmm. or change professions hmm. out of sport and you know, do what you want. But hmm. definitely those are the two choices. There's not too many 50-year-olds still on the gym floor or running around the track. There are some, uh, you know, but uh, yeah, you're going to need to make those choices. You can keep doing it. Hmm. You know? And a good system is, hey, maybe that high, just come back from high performance into mid-high performance or high school. Hmm. And a lot of our top coaches in Australia are doing that now. It's a lot of the big private uh, high schools with lots of money are hiring really good coaches who have been at high performance, don't want to travel anymore, mm. don't want to do management, don't want to lecture or don't have a PhD to lecture, they go work at the high schools now. Mm. We've got a couple of guys doing that, it's fantastic for them. These big private high schools say, this guy's working high performance for 20 years with this and this team, he's gone to the such and such games, he'd be our strength and conditioning coach and the kids love it. And it is great. Mm. So that's a third option now for us, you know, big private schools are mm. hiring strength and conditioning coaches. So. Now we've got three options, I suppose. Okay, interesting. Mm. And the, for example, if you, if you look at the lecturer option, mm. you think it's because the lifestyle is a bit more quiet or is it also some kind of giving back? It's a giving back thing as well. Uh, I was very lucky in Australia, and this is why I do a lot of giving back, is when I went to university, we didn't have to pay for university in Australia. It was free. Mm. People have to pay now. Not, not the full amount. They pay about 20% of the cost. It's not like America where they pay the full cost plus profit. In Australia, you pay about 20% of the cost of university. I don't know what they pay, maybe 10 or 12,000 a year. When I went through, it was free. So I give back because I got a lot of good education for free. Hmm. But uh, I also like educating. It's good. I, for me, I, I'm still coaching. You know, we were out there that day taking a session. You know, I was coaching max velocity today. They were coaching clean, snatches, jerks. Hmm. Um, power jerk split jerks and then back out in the track this afternoon coaching max aerobic speed you know with the other coaches i'm still yellow i'm still counting times i'm you know still giving coaching cues so i still coach today like three or four hours but i coach coaches same doesn't matter the athletes or coaches i'm still coaching so yeah it was good okay cool as an snc coach what's your coaching philosophy uh, do what works so I, I see a lot of and that's a good question I always get that, what's your philosophy? Is I do what works, what, 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 what does the evidence say? The evidence might be scientific evidence, it might be a coach. If I talk to you and you say to me, uh, this Bulgarian split squad's better for my cyclists, I say, well, that's evidence to me, because you're coaching high-level cyclists, and I'm not, so I would use that as evidence. Um, so if I ever did coach cyclists, you know, I'd, I'd talk to you or another, uh, maybe Scott Pollock from England, or someone who coached cyclists, that's evidence if you worked at high performance. So do what works. You know, and don't be holding to a philosophy. Like, I see that a lot in America where people say, oh, I'm a heavyweights guy, or I'm a functional guy, or oh, I, I'm a one-legged guy, or why not do whatever works? Yeah. Maybe one leg and two leg stuff works. Maybe functional exercises are good in the warm-up. Maybe heavy strength training works good too. You know, wh wh why lock yourself into a cult belief that there's only one way to some nirvana or one way to some pathway to high performances via one track? You know, if we get to the top of a mountain, different tracks can lead there. You know, like uh, there's more than one road that leads to Amsterdam or Berlin or something. You know, there's <laughs> other ways there. You still get in the center of town. Yeah. You know, so don't lock yourself into a philosophy. What we do know, there's hard work, works. Yeah. Different ways of working hard, but hard work works. So, do what works and work hard. That's mm. my philosophy. Core values as a coach. What are your core values? Hard work, hard work, and um, just yeah, just 
be honest with, with the hard work. Don't don't try and hard don't try and give me a bullshit story about how hard you're working or that you've got an injury just so you can not work hard. It's mm. hard work. You know, I'll I'll reduce the training volume when we need to and up the intensity and vice versa. But work hard. You turn up and work hard on the basics. Don't find excuses, do bullshit. Well, I can't squat today because I've got you know well, bullshit. Get in there and train hard. Yeah. Yeah. Work hard. You know, uh, there's a lot of these sayings that might sound pithy and, you know, uh, the only, but one of my things I read once was this good quote I like is, the only place where success comes before work is in the dictionary. Vince Lombardi. Is it? I had that on my, uh, long ago I had a business card oh. and I had it on the business card. I didn't know it was from Vince. Okay, there you go. Well, I've learned something. Thank you, mate. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I, I like that one. That's one of my favourite quotes. I've got millions of other quotes, but that's my, one of my yeah. uh, favourites. Yes. People say, oh, he's successful. He won the lottery. No, he's not successful. He's lucky. Mm. You win the lottery. That's not success. You didn't work for that. That's luck. Yeah. Success is something you work for. Yeah. So, yeah. I align with that. Yeah. Thank you, mate. Well, <laughs> I, I better align that. <laughs> Just because I had it on that business card for... All right. For some time. Well, giddy up, hey? Beers later on that one. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. A few days ago we spoke and you said your intrinsic motivation is to raise the standard of strength and conditioning in the world. Mm. And you're going to do that through the ASCA. Yeah. Yeah? Trying, yeah. Explain what, or outline why is that your intrinsic motivation? Ah... You know, some sports administrators and coaches don't see strength conditioning as a profession. Physical therapy is, chiropractic is, you know, obviously medicine is, uh, nursing is. Why, why isn't strength conditioning not? We contribute to performance of an athlete. So it's a profession. I have a professional degree. As do most strength conditioning coaches. We have degrees, we just don't learn out of a back of a cornflakes packet. We went to university. We went to university. Uh, we have certifications. It's a profession. Um, so one of our sports administrators and uh, uh, team owners uh, or, or CEOs or professional teams in sports and others start realising that, all the better. Now they do realise that in Australia because they've been made to realise that. Mm. Uh, thanks to some very good work by some of our ASCA members and by the Australian Sports Commission by showing some leadership in the world in this area. Um, it's been very good for us. Uh, it's the start of a very good era for us, the last probably six or nine months. Um, and uh, s- someone has to lead the way. It's not being shown by in other countries. So uh, ASCA will, will try and uh, lead the way. Someone can go past us, all power to them you know, in, in improving the profession. But uh, I'll use a quote from uh, Ray Bone, Navy SEAL, US Navy SEAL number one. Leadership can summed up in two words, follow me. So follow us and we'll show leadership in the area. If you want to go past us and improve what we're doing, please do. But in the meantime, are we a leader? Well, when I say I, the ASCA will try and be a leader. Follow us, and uh, we'll raise a standard for everyone. Because when the tide comes in, all boats float higher. Yeah. So uh, hopefully we can do that, and we're seeing that, you know, and it's starting to happen now. I think a lot of people don't like to seeing a small country like Australia lead the way in this area in the world. They say, well, if the Australians and can do it, so can we. So that's good. Um, there's other places with more resources and more money than us. So hopefully. Um, we can lead the way and others will take over hmm. uh, or, or, or at least follow suit and we can have the equal professions. Yeah. So like if you're a doctor in, in the Netherlands, you're a doctor in Australia, you have to go through and you know, make sure you're in tune with the regulations and stuff there, but you're still a doctor. Hmm. So if I'm a strength conditioning coach in Australia at a certain level, can I be a strength conditioning coach in the Netherlands or England or the US or Canada or China or India, any of these countries. So let's have a profession where we have a, a good level uh, at a certain level we recognise that person's qualifications and uh, their uh, abilities. Okay, and then just where are we in that process? So if we look at a doctor or a profession that is very well established, mm. where are we in that? We're a, we're a very young profession and we're beginning. Uh, 
in Australia, we have a certain, what we call RPL, recognised prior learning. So we have an arrangement where if someone from another country with a certification comes to, wants to work in Australia, we will give them an RPL to a certain level. Um, uh, they'll also have to do certain things and you know, a little bit of an exam and uh, sign some papers and, and document their stuff. That doesn't happen currently in a lot of other countries not recognised as Australia. So we'll lead the way in that again. If they don't want to do it, they say, oh, no, we can't do it. And we've had discussions with other nations. They don't want to do it. Fine. Again, follow me. Hmm. I'll lead the way. When I say I, I'm talking about my board. Yeah. The plural I. We yeah. will lead the way. <laughs> um, so we have a certain RPL or recognised prior learning equivalency um, for certain people. Uh, if they have a certain qualification in a country and so many years experience, we'll assign them a certain level in our ASCA system. Hmm. So, uh, so for example, uh, we're doing an ASCA level two course now here in the Netherlands, mm -hmm. uh, and we have people from uh, you know, the Netherlands and from Ireland and, and uh, France and that, and they were given uh, an equivalency of ASCA level one already based on their work experience and their degree so they could do go straight to ASCA level two. So we recognize their prior achievements in learning and in work experience. You already got level one, now you're doing straight to level two. Mm. So that's an example of it. Mm. What person has impacted you most as a coach and why? Uh, my former head coach of the Brisbane Broncos, uh, Wayne Bennett, he's a very influential coach to a lot of people because uh, he's been he's been our head coach for uh, since 19, at, at the National League level since 1987, and he's still going there, so what's that now? 32 years, and before that he was in the, like the second division as a successful coach for, God, he even coached my brother in the 1970s, so, <laughs> 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 in, a, in an under-19 team, under-18 team, under 18 team of some, so he's been around a long time, he, he's 70 years of age now, so he's probably a pretty influential coach in... Not, not to do with strength conditioning, but in man management or person management, how you deal with situations, uh, how you try and get the best out of players, things like that. I think he's been very influential to a lot of people. He, he won Coach of the Year in Australia uh, once or twice uh, for team sport athletes. So, so a pretty influential coach. Uh, for overall coaching, not strength conditioning. Mm -hmm. uh, strength conditioning coach, there are tons of strength conditioning coaches that influence me, so I couldn't single out one, but there's lots of great strength conditioning coaches that uh, like I really respect. Um, so uh, any, basically any, almost anyone working in high performance, if they say something, I take it on board. Mm. Because you're working in high performance for more than one year. To stay in your job, you've just got to you know, know something. And uh, uh, so I listen. So. Uh, Overall coaches, I don't want to mention one because they'd be almost everyone I met in high performance influences me. Hmm. Almost everyone. I can't can't even think of one that doesn't hmm. who's in high performance. I don't know, maybe he's a bum coach or she's a bum coach, but I can't think of one. Okay. Because anyone in high performance, you kept your job for more than one or two years, you must know something. Therefore, I need to learn off it because uh, you've had different experiences. Etc. Etc. So I'll learn off anyone in high performance. So as an SMC coach, you you have your idea of how things have to run, right? More mm -hmm. or less. And sometimes mm -hmm. athletes have different ideas. So yeah. what do you do if the if the if the ideas differ? Yeah, uh, that was a problem for me twenty something years ago. Uh, you know, when when I got this hard work ethic, and you got some prima donna type athletes who are you know. They don't want to work hard. Yeah, I, and I did have problems with some athletes. And I probably, going back, I'd handle it differently, I can say in hindsight. But some people have said to me, well, if you handle it differently, you wouldn't be who you are. So maybe I wouldn't have been as effective because, uh, you know, my nature is a certain way. <laughs> and... Uh, there are, you know, we, we, we need to talk about the expectations and the athlete's accountability. And 
one of the things I liked about my former rugby league team, the Brisbane Broncos, was accountability was huge. You know, like uh, the athletes were accountable and the staff were accountable. The head coach would give you free, almost free reign to do your job. So, well, if you fuck up, you're getting the sack. Mm. Well, fine, I won't fuck up. You know, I won't muck up. So, and the athletes, you know, they knew they were accountable. So here's the performance level you must meet. Don't meet it. You know? mm. It's going to be two people's fault. Your fault or my fault if I don't write a good enough program. I used to keep stats on how many guys made their goals, you know, it'd be 85% of this, and on, on uh, their strength scores, and normally it'd be 93% of guys achieve their goal. Hmm. So I'd say to a guy, there's a 93% chance, 3 chance that if you don't make your goal that I've set, which is a realistic goal, but challenging, 93% hmm. chance is I'm not at fault. Hmm. And so if you don't make your goal, Whose fucking fault is it? <laughs> it's going to be yours. So, boom. So, you know, I just want guys to be accountable. Mm. Right? I'll give you the best program and, and as, as good as I can do, I should the best program, the good as I can do with the situations, the resources, the time to help you achieve your goals, you put in the hard effort and we should achieve an outcome. Mm. Now, maybe you get an injury, maybe something happens, but if we don't achieve our outcome, someone's to blame. If there's no injuries or no you know, life trauma or something, either you don't work hard enough or I didn't write a good enough program or coach you well enough. Hmm. So in 7 to 15% of the time, it's my fault and I'll put my hand up. But some of those times, it's going to be your fault. Own the fucking fault. Hmm. Yeah. So that's trying to make those athletes own that. Um, it's a great strength conditioning coach at uh, Stanford called Shannon Turley, Stanford University, and he talks about a player's mindset of, of technician, professional, semi-professional, basically cancer. Uh, and a technician sees their performance as, as them, and they seek out a coach to do extra training or how do they improve. Professional just does what they're told. Semi-professional does what they like doing. You know, they don't like doing what they're not good at or they don't like. And cancer doesn't want to do anything and tells other people we shouldn't be doing this. So you've got to work out where those athletes are hmm. in that spectrum. And we're going to try, try and change cancer to semi-professional and semi-professional to professional, professionals to technicians. So we, as long as we know that their mindset is on one of that, that continuum of technician to cancer, you know, we know what they are. So sometimes you can't cure cancer, you've got to get rid of it. Hmm. <laughs> Cut it out. Interesting, yeah. yeah. Okay, I see that. If we think about a high-performance team, there are many members on the support staff. Mm. And very often, everyone wears his own hat mm. in the support staff. So the S&C coach has a certain idea mm. and other members have a, another yeah. idea. If there are clashes within that team, how do you make your point heard? That's number one. Yeah. And number two, if a decision is taken that is not yours or you don't agree, mm. What do you do? Yeah, that's that, and that's a that's a great question, question, question. That happens all the time in a big team. <laughs> uh, physio or doctor says, "Oh, they can't do this." Oh, yeah, they God, they can do it. You know, just you know, we can fix this up, or well, you know, if we reduce load. And we saw that a few years ago. You know, a lot of physios and doctors want to reduce load to the players, and then we've got more injuries. And we've seen that, you know, uh, maintaining high loads is protective of injury not reducing these loads. So thankfully that debate's already been settled by statistics, nothing like science to settle a debate. Um, but yeah, I've been in plenty of situations where, uh, where I didn't, um, uh, didn't agree with some of the training we're doing. So then you've got two choices. Do you just shut up and do it? But voice your opinion. And I've been there, I've said to the coach once, This is not going to work, coach, what you're doing, you know? And I just want to say, I'll do it. It's not going to work. And after the season, the coach said, you were right. Uh, we won't do it next year and uh, we'll change and we'll get rid of that system. And um, so now if it's really offend you, you can always resign. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how much money do you owe? <laughs> mm -hmm. well, do you have a home loan? <laughs> can you just walk out of that job straight into another one? Do you hold your ground? So you, you have to... 
I'm not saying you should hold your ground. Sometimes you don't agree with stuff, but you've got a wife, family, uh, home loans to pay, uh, car loans to pay. You've just got to pay your bills, but you just got to say, I don't agree with it. I want to put it on record, I don't agree with it. But if the group's made a decision, am I going to do it? The group goes forward. But just let me say, I don't agree with it, but I'll, I'll work with it now. Hmm. But if it doesn't work, can we please try my way the next time? Hmm. And for the, this reason. So let's keep data on this and see if it works. Hmm. So I think you've got to uh, use the scientific method. Hmm. Does it work? No. But voice your opinion. But you, you know, we're in a high performance team is a collaborative team so we've got to collaborate and agree sometimes to even if we don't agree that we have to agree to put forward to the athletes we don't want to be the cancer saying coach wants me to give this training this really shit but I don't believe in it we can't be cancerous like that Yeah. so we've got to say okay boys we're doing this hmm. or girls we're doing this you mightn't agree with it but uh, you just have to do it sometimes hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a really hard thing it happens all the time in high performance yeah no. assistant coach wants to do this you think no assistant coach don't we I, it, we know that every single assistant coach wants to be a head coach mm. and every single assistant coach seeks a little bit of extra work with the athletes where their hat is so mm. if you get a defensive coach he'll seek a little bit of extra work with them and all of a sudden we got extra loans mm. that you know he's taking them out for extra sessions happens all the time okay. so we just got to and regulate that hmm. <laughs> happens all the time and there's a specific example I would like to dig in when I saw you the first time in 2010 to 11 at the UKSA you presented the scores of your team hmm. in the strength and conditioning hmm. and I remember at some point there was a dip yeah and in that presentation you said there was a different coach he wanted you to focus more on strength endurance, endurance yeah. rather than yeah. maximum strength yeah. development yeah I think that would be some kind of That's situation, That's what I was just right? talking about, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, strength coach, I don't agree with this. And, you know, and it didn't really work out for us. And, uh, you know, the next year we uh, went back to the strength power way of training and won the competition. Nice. <laughs> so, we probably could have won it the year before <laughs> if we'd stayed on strength and power. So, but, um, yeah, so that was... Uh, a whole year where yeah, I was made to do like about eight minutes of strength work a week or 15 minutes of strength work. T you know, seven minutes on squatting, seven minutes on bench pressing, and all the rest of the week was strength endurance circuits. Mm. It's like, fuck me, dude. <laughs> and did, did the coach change or was it the same coach? No, no, strength, same, same coach. Okay. Same coach, but um, uh, some of the conditioning staff were uh, changed then because mm. it was their idea more to do strength endurance. Uh, some of the strength conditioning staff so I sort of got outvoted like two as to one so it changed around so the head coach went with their philosophy that we needed more strength endurance so we had three, three strength conditioning staff two wanted to go that way I didn't went that way so the coach uh, got, uh, changed them at the end of the year mm. and said you're right it didn't work for us we'll go back to speed and strength and power next year yeah. uh, as far as our uh, gym work and that's going so, yeah, so that happens. How does a typical training day in an SNC coach at a professional rugby club look like? For the athletes or? For the SNC coach. For me? Your day when you were an SNC oh, coach. Oh, my day. It uh, uh, depends. The pre season, it's, the preparation period is a lot longer days. So, um, so if I go through the last few years when I work, so I would get up at about 4 a.m. in the morning, uh, just have some coffee, have a shower. I only lived 100 kilometers away from the club, so it would take me about an hour and a half to drive there. 100? Yeah. Okay. So, you get there, you had to be there at, before, at 6 o'clock. Uh, the players are on the field at 6.30, so you've got like half an hour of preparation time and doing stuff. You know, stretching guys, setting cones, stuff like that. Uh, it was pretty hot where I lived, so we had to do our uh, high-intensity endurance stuff first in the morning. Because uh, if we go any later, uh, they get sunburnt or dehydrated or you know, something it would be like 30 degrees by 6 30 or 7 in the morning so we have <laughs> eight, we're trying to finish by uh, eight o'clock and then uh, uh, you know we would do some recovery stuff and then about 11 or, and the players would eat and then about 11 the players would lift but they're, they're lifting in an air-conditioned gym then they've had three hours recovery so we'd have one group start at 11 
One at about 11.45 and one at 12.30 um, on 40. They're on an hour rotation, but uh, uh, a group comes down at uh, 11.45. They warm up in another room with another strength conditioning staff for like 10 minutes. So sort of 11.55, they come in the gym with me, hmm. blah, 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 blah. So most of those guys then are finished by uh, 1.30. They have lunch, do some recovery stuff, the strength conditioning staff, then um, do some other stuff. And we might have some younger athletes or second division athletes. So probably finish uh, uh, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, something like that. And uh, then I drive home, be home by 5.30 or 6 fall asleep straight away <laughs> uh, for about 20 minutes and then my wife woke me up and have dinner and then uh, watch TV for an hour and go out and do it again. <laughs> uh, in season, it's a little bit different because you've got games and get, you're doing half the amount of training. Um, so, uh, so it's, it's a lot easier in season. Um, so it just de- depends on the team playing away or at home, how many guys are injured, uh, so forth. But you have... You know, different days. You might have your first division guys playing training in the gym Monday and Wednesday. The second division could be Tuesday and Thursday. Um, could have injured guys on different days as well. Uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, um, and then you you know that's the gym sessions. Then you've got your MAS conditioning sessions and speed sessions. So it's a lot more varied in season because um, we could play on a Thursday, uh, on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or even occasionally Monday night. But normally. Uh, Friday, Saturday or Sunday, so change each week. Um, and the second division guys would play in either a Saturday or a Sunday. Mm-hmm. So they're on a different rotation from the first division guys. So a lot, lot more variation in the uh, in season. Hmm. Uh, and, and shorter days generally, obviously. Okay. So it's all good. Yeah, okay, cool. Okay, how do you design a training program? It just take me us through the thought process. Uh, well, after about one year, I realized the easiest way to do it was cut and paste last year's program in. <laughs> <laughs> and this is how I start, cut and paste last year's program in for that, those athletes. And then look at my notes and say, what have I learned in the last year to improve this program? Now, sometimes last year's program was maybe a six-week block, and this year you got seven weeks, or you got five. So you decide which week to eliminate first off. Okay, so I've got last year's six week block, now I've got a seven week block, I've got an out a week, or it's a five week, I've got to take one off. Okay, now, what worked well? I check my notes, check my uh, data. Uh, I thought this combination of exercises didn't work well, or um, I, I saw a, a different way of doing it at, at, at a conference, or I talked to uh, a coach, and he, he has this idea. So then I'd change the program, but I come down with that template of, at last year's, when I designed this program last year, this is the best program I could have designed with the level of knowledge I had. So I put that in and say, now how's my level of knowledge changed? So if it's, a, if it's the same six or eight week block, I don't have to change any of the weeks unless I want to. So say it's an eight week block. What have I learned? What can I make this eight week block better than it was last year, which should have been the peak of my knowledge. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, what was I doing? What did I learn? And that's how I change it. So it might only be subtle changes, or I might say, no, that that was. I need to change the last three weeks there of that eight week block that just didn't work out for me. Um, so I, you know, I just do that, cut and paste. Now, obviously, you've got to come up with the first program, so that's a bit harder. <laughs> um, so I just think of my fundamental movements, uh, what I'm going to do. So I work out my weeks, um, and what sort of sets and repetitions and intensities I want my main movements and my second movements, and I do that for strength and power exercises, and so forth, and then any other things I need to put in like that. So the first program is obviously the hardest. Like I said, then I cut, paste, and look at it, Hmm. and check my notes. Hmm. So for the second, third year, it's an easier process, because it's reflective review of your own program, and what have I learned in that last year to make this program for this stage of the season, whether general prep, specific prep, in season, uh, early in season, mid in, you know, how do I make it better than I did it last year? Hmm. So it's a more reflective review then. First time is a lot harder. It takes a lot more time because you're creating it from scratch. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Okay, cool. One thing that sparked my interest, yeah. you're a man of science, you have yeah. a PhD. 
but also as coaches we are kind of artists, right? Yeah. So how do you see the profession of strength and conditioning? Is it science or is it art? Is it? Yeah, it's both. But even you know, art is science. You know, we can you know, uh, uh, everything comes down to science in, in the end. We just might be able to explain the science right now, so we call it art. But, you know, people say, oh, there's an art of communicating. No, it's a science. It's psychology and sociology explain a lot of these things. Uh, I think Coach Brett Bartholomew does a good job explaining that, you know. It, you call it an art, but it's a science. There's data behind how we interact and all that stuff. So it, 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 it is science, predominantly science. Probably there is an art to it that we might know the science of, and that's why we call it art of the person management of developing group culture or individual culture or individual accountability within a, uh, things like that. So, yeah, but so, but basically I think it is an interaction of what we might call this stage because we don't know all the science. It is an art, hmm. you know, how we put things together. Um, I think in a few more times, a, bit, a few more years or decades, but it'll be more, a lot more easily explained the science of what we do mm. right now where you see that's a good program I can't explain exactly why but it's getting a result you know uh, you look at programs of, in the 1950s or you know Bill Starr in the 1960s five sets of five you know probably couldn't understand the, the science of it all well, but now we can you know so that's a pretty good program you know, it works on a number of levels at this stage Uh, this level of athlete works pretty good. We got you know different reasons. There's enough volume. There's enough neural activation. Blah blah blah. Hmm. Back then, it was just seen as an art of the program. We can work it out now. So I think. So I'm a man of science, but I do see the art of it. And, but as Brett says, we can. There's science beyond the art. Uh, if you look at psychology and a lot of psych, uh, even other studies explain the art that we might be able to explain. Hmm. Other people could though. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to nominate someone to be interviewed? Uh, uh, I think a really good guy to interview in Australia is one of my former colleagues who works back at my club, a guy called Andrew Kroll. And he's good because, you know, he's worked in pro sports uh, at my club and another club he went up to top competition worked in the Olympic sports at the Queensland Academy of Sport you know we worked taekwondo swimming triathlon and all that but what makes him a uh, good interview is as we talked about most strength conditioning coaches have a strength background mm -hmm. his background is a triathlete he's done the Hawaiian Ironman so he's like slim triathlete type body shape but he's a strength conditioning coach so he's the exact opposite uh, body type how, how we perceive he's this lean whippet aerobic uh, machine but he's pretty good in the gym you know he's teach he's snatch technique squat everything is is, is perfect he's an ASA level three coach well I think he's really good because he's just different as in his background it comes from triathlon but he yeah. works in team sports and he's really odd because he's an Australian who doesn't drink <laughs> 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 and vegetarian? <laughs> no, no. no. <laughs> It's like an Australian who doesn't drink. What the hell's going on there? <laughs> but it, I think he, he's got this really weird background of, of not weird background, but it's, it's totally different to the traditional strength yeah. conditioning, which is you know, always a, a form of weightlifter, powerlifter, track and field athlete, or, 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 or someone from the power sports or volleyball or uh, uh, rugby or something like that. Mm. He's coming from this triathlon background as a high level strength and conditioning coach. Hmm. So, you know, he was working as a strength and conditioning coach for the, you know, the tri Australian triathlon team. And, and then gets recruited back into professional rugby. Hmm. Yeah, that's an easy transition. <laughs> Over in Spain, you know, last July, <laughs> November he's working back with professional rugby players who are 110 kilograms from the triathlon team. <laughs> so hmm. that, that's a, it's a, just an interesting journey Hmm. And uh, an interesting character. He's not well yeah. known around the world. He's too busy working as a strength conditioning coach. But he's a pretty interesting guy, and he's uh, probably obviously very intelligent. So okay. worked together in a long time. Uh, so yeah, okay. and there's and a lot of other interesting guys like that. Cool. So before I let you off the hook, <laughs> what 
the person you just mentioned, yeah. how is he received by rugby players? I would imagine because knowing a little bit of rugby players, there's someone who's fairly... Oh, no, they love him. Yeah? Oh, yeah, because he, like, he worked with me. So he, he, when he joined my club, I, I sort of recommended him because I worked with him in, the, in a second division team uh, where... The feeder club for my team had second division players, mm -hmm. and he was a strength conditioning coach for that feeder team. And I had to go work with him in the afternoon because uh, when our second division players joined his team and swelled the numbers up, so I'd go mm -hmm. and join him. I said, He's, "This guy's a pretty good coach. We should get him in, work with our our team, uh, the real team, not the feeder team." Fuck them, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, his job then was to come in and, and work in our pathway players from 15 to 19. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these guys. He went on the journey with them, so he started coaching them when they're 15. Hmm. Three, four years later, they're in the some of the 19 or 20. They're in the uh, professional first division team, not playing first team, but in the training squad. And he's joined them in that pathway. He's taken them all the way through. Hmm. So he's trained these guys since 15, 16. So they love him. You know, he's okay. taken them on the journey. Um, so he's been there so long and been so successful. And he's got a a uh, big, vibrant personality. You'll know he's in the room. He doesn't drink. He doesn't need to drink. <laughs> <laughs> he's not one of these quite retiring guys who's sip, sipping a, you know, uh, a lemonade. He, he'll be shouting and having fun, and you know, you might think he's drunk. Okay. <laughs> so he's got a big personality, and um, yeah, the guys love him because uh, he's a big personality, and is a successful coach, and mm. can get those players 100 percent, and. Uh, He's got lots of skills. Um, he's really good on uh, with injured players and rehabbing them and stuff like that, and looking after them. So, great, great coach. Oh, and we've got a lot of great coaches in Australia. But that's one of our level three coaches. Another guy is Andrew Lullum, who uh, I coached when he was a lifter, and he's a level three coach. And uh, he was a powerlifter, and he's also now like also an assistant high jump and long jump coach. Hmm. <laughs> it's like my height, like five foot nine or something. But he worked with the high jumpers and long jump is so long that as a strength conditioning coach uh, that the actual jumping coach said you may have got to help me out in the track here you know sometimes and did so much work with the official jumping coach that it's like the jumping coach's right hand man now mm. as a jumping coach I don't think Andrew could jump over that fucking coffee table <laughs> <laughs> represented an Australian powerlifting but you know, I don't think he could high jump but yeah. a coach's eye you know if you, if you know what you're looking for and has been trained what to look for so he'd be good too because Experienced strength conditioning coach. He worked in uh, pro sports and but in the academy in the Olympic sports now for uh, ten or fifteen years. Hmm. Uh, and uh, you now his high jumpers are doing step ups with one hundred and eighty kilograms. I don't know how to do a step up with like sixty. I don't know how to do one eighty. I'm gonna show a video of this guy doing one fifty k step up. Fuck! What the hell's going on there? So he, he's an interesting cat too. You know, uh, he does drink though. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so th I've known these two guys for a long time. I've known Andrew for um, uh, t 25 years. So I used to coach him when he was a teenager, like 18 or 19. So he's a really good coach too. So they're both ASCA level three coaches, master coaches, top coaches. So either one of those would be pretty good. Uh, both worked in pro sports, both worked in Olympic sports. Um, so either one is pretty good. Okay, cool. There'd be two people that people don't know of. There's other good coaches in Australia that people know of. Like, yeah. Oh, we have two, so that's good. Yeah. That's good. Cool. Um, where can people find you? Uh, I'm all over the place. <laughs> oh, you mean online, you mean? Or anywhere? Uh, I do a lot of travel with the education, so I, I came in the Netherlands this week. Next week I'll be in China. Week after that, I'm in Singapore. Week after that, I'm in India. Then I'm in Indonesia. Then I'm in India again. Then I'm in China. Then I'm in Indonesia. Then I'm in the Philippines. Then I might be in France. So I'm all over the place. It'd be hard to find me. <laughs> but uh, I have a website called uh, uh, danbakerstrength.com. Yep. So you can go there and see some stuff. There's some free resources on there like you know, papers I wrote and some videos on doing shit you know doing stuff so but uh, yeah that's I'm all over the place <laughs> okay cool <laughs> and um, it's also worth noting you give
clinics worldwide if people want to. Yes, and yeah. I think they can go through yeah, your they website. Can, yeah, they can contact. If they want to do a workshop, you know, I don't do workshops on, you know, using velocity and resistance training, how to use bands and chains, uh, maximal aerobic speed, uh, long-term planning of strength and power, you know, periodization, what sets and reps work best for, you know, you know 15-year-olds, 18-year-olds, 20-year-olds, advanced athletes from different sports. You know, we go through all that. So, yeah, if they want to do workshops or, or courses uh, like that with me, they can. Um, if they want to do an ASCA certification course, they should contact the ASCA, not me. Yeah. <laughs> ASCA does all that stuff. I just turn up and lecture. Yeah. Okay. But, so there's two different things. If you want a Dan Baker uh, workshop, contact me. If you want an ASCA certification, contact the ASCA. I'm only, a, I'm only an unpaid president. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we have administrative staff who do administration stuff. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Good. Thank yeah. you very much, mate. That's Thanks great. For that. Thank you. Thank you for the great questions. Thanks for your time. No worries. We're at the end of the day two here at the ASCA level two, and Dan has agreed to that interview. So, thanks a lot after a full day of lecturing. Yeah. Thanks. No for worries. That. Thank you, mate.